All right, welcome back. This is week six in our study on the Gospel of Mark. And this week we're going to be talking about what does it cost to follow Jesus. And so we're going to be looking specifically at Jesus' mission, what he came to do and why he came to do it. And we've been talking a lot about um, how Jesus was a different kind of Messiah than the people expected. And I want us to see this week that Jesus was even different than the disciples expected. So even the disciples, as close as they were to Jesus, were a little bit confused about uh, what role he was to play, who he was. And remember that the Gospel of Mark um, is concerned all the way through with this question, who is Jesus? Uh, Who is he? Do people understand who he is and what he's come to do? And so that's what Mark, the author, is trying to answer. We're going to start by looking at Mark 10, 45. It says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So this is the end of the scripture passage we're going to be looking at. But I want us to see here that Jesus is telling us, this is Jesus speaking, but he's explaining a little bit about his mission. And that includes uh, serving, suffering, and giving his life as a ransom or a sacrifice for everyone. Okay, Jesus was a different kind of Messiah. He was different than their expectations. Jesus had a plan to restore our broken relationship with God. He was a Messiah who came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. God sent Jesus to live a perfect life, to die in our place, and to conquer pain, death, and evil. So this gives us an idea of Jesus' understanding of who he was and what he was doing. And we've talked a little bit about this idea of the messianic expectations of the people during this time period, what they would have expected from their Messiah. And the Jews had a long tradition or understanding that there was a Messiah that was coming. But when they thought about it, they thought about it in two ways. And one was um, they thought about their Messiah in the view of Moses. And Moses was an Old Testament figure who liberated the Jewish people. So he was someone who was responsible for bringing them into freedom. So when the Jews, uh, during Jesus' time, thought about a Messiah, they expected someone to come and bring them Uh, into freedom, because at the time when Jesus lived, the Jews were living under the occupation of the Roman Empire. So they were wanting someone to come to their rescue. They're looking for someone to rescue them like Moses. And then the other picture that they had of a Messiah was King David from the Old Testament. And King David was a political leader that was also a warrior who had won a lot of um, military victories for the Jewish people. So he brought in this time of prosperity and wealth and peace, but he did that through battles and he was successful and then he ruled the people. So those are the two images that the people have in their minds when they think about Messiah, a liberator and a warrior king. So those are their expectations. And we'll see how that plays into um, people's understanding of who Jesus is. Even the disciples kind of get confused by those images. But I want us to see that Jesus had a different mission. So Jesus had a different mission. He had a different plan than what they expected. And I want us to see that in chapters 8 through 10, Jesus repeats for the disciples three different times the specifics of what's going to happen to them. So he lays it out for them in very clear clear detail three different times. And each time he tells them, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be sentenced to death. I'm going to be killed, and then I'm going to be raised from the dead. So he lays this out for them just in a very direct way. And each time they have a very odd response. So the first time Peter argues with Jesus and says, this is never going to happen. He doesn't want this to happen to Jesus. And he's really upset that Jesus talks about his death in this way. Um, And the second time, it says that the disciples were really confused and they were scared to ask him any questions because it really made no sense to them at all. And then the third time we're going to look at in greater detail today and we'll see it's it's just a very interesting response altogether. So um, three different times, Jesus is very clear about what's going to happen to them and the disciples are confused because it doesn't really fit with their image or their idea of who Messiah is or what Messiah would come to do. Okay, so we're going to look at Mark 10:32 through 45. 
It says that they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And I want us to see that Jesus is leading the way. So he is being intentional about this journey. He has a mission and he is following and, and being obedient to that call. So he is headed there and they're following, but I want us to see their reaction. So it says that the disciples were astonished and those who followed were afraid, which is a really interesting reaction. So what was it about this journey that was causing astonishment and fear? And at the time, it's important to know a little bit about the background of what was happening. So they were going to Jerusalem during the time of Passover, which was a Jewish festival that essentially um, celebrated their independence or their freedom. That first time they had been, Moses had led them out of bondage in Egypt. So that's what they're celebrating, which is sort of Jewish independence as that for them as a people. And the Roman Empire, any time that Passover came around, would get very nervous because if there were any sort of um, tension or turmoil or political unrest that was going to happen, it would probably happen during this festival. So everyone is on high alert. It's a time of tension. Um, and Jesus would have been safe if he had stayed away from Jerusalem. He'd been teaching his disciples further out in more remote villages, but now he set his face towards Jerusalem. He's headed there intentionally, and the disciples are, again, nervous, like, what is he doing? Because they know that um, if there's going to be opposition to Jesus, it's going to happen in Jerusalem. So why would you intentionally walk into that kind of situation? Um, and it's in that setting that Jesus tells the disciples, here's what's going to happen to me. Okay, Jesus says, we are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. So again, Jesus is giving a detailed explanation of what they should expect, and he's just point by point saying, here's what's going to happen, who's going to do it, and here will be the results of that. Okay, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. So James and John are two of Jesus' 12 disciples, and they're sort of on the inner circle. They're, they're close to Jesus, and they're the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee is their dad. But their nickname that they had within the, the team of the disciples was the Sons of Thunder, which tells you something about their personalities. Um, I don't really know what that means, but it means I think that they were sort of compulsive or impulsive, that they said and did things just on emotion. So here they come to Jesus, and I love this because they ask a question sort of like, you know, a toddler asks a question, right? They're like, we want you to go ahead and do for us whatever we ask, but we're not going to tell you what it is yet. We want you to promise us you're going to give it to us before we tell you what it is. Um, and then Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? So that he answers them with another question. And they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with a bapti baptism I am baptized with? So their question or their request is a position. They're asking to be on his right and his left when he comes into his glory. So they're headed up to Jerusalem. They're nervous because they know this is going to force a confrontation and they don't know what the result of that confrontation is going to be. But they're hopeful. Again, in their head, they're thinking maybe he's going to be like David or Moses and he's going to go in there and conquer all of the Roman Empire right now and we get to go with him. And then when he's a king, we want to have positions of power and glory on either side of him. So that's what they're thinking. Um, but Jesus responds in an interesting way um, and he asks them if they are ready to share in his suffering and his sacrifice. So I want us to see there's two different things happening. They're thinking fame and glory for themselves. They're thinking we want the benefits of being Jesus' close associates uh, without any cost. And Jesus is saying, that's not the sort of Messiah I am. I came to suffer and to serve. 
All right. So he's asked them, are you ready to share in my sufferings? And they answer, we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. So they said they could. Remember we talked last week about the rich young ruler who had the same sort of attitude of like, I've already done everything I need to do. You know, you should bless me because I've come to you with these questions um, and had just this high view of themselves. And you see that in James and John here. They firmly believe that they're ready to do what it takes. Um, so they don't really understand what Jesus is asking them. But I want us to see that Jesus is te- trying to teach them here that following him means service and sacrifice because that's his mission. That's what he's doing, and he wants them to follow his example. So his style of leadership involves suffering and sacrifice, and he expects the same of his followers. Okay. When the ten, the other ten disciples heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. So this is kind of my favorite here, is that you see that the other ten are furious. And the question is, you know, why are they mad? Are they mad because of James and John's request? Or are they mad because they didn't think of it first? And this kind of reminds me, I I was joking about this this week, but it reminds me of playing shotgun in high school. I don't know if any of you ever did this, but um, shotgun is the privilege of riding in the passenger seat when you're in the car because you have radio privileges and you can, you know, handle the temperature or whatever, but it's the most comfortable seat in the front. And so the way we used to play this was there were rules. You couldn't call shotgun until you were outside in view of the vehicle. So it didn't count if you called it inside. You had to wait till you were in the parking lot or wherever. And the first person to see the car who yelled out shotgun would have the privilege of riding in the front seat. Um, And I kind of feel like that's what's happening with James and John here, right? So they they had this brilliant idea to ask for these privileged places um, before they get to Jerusalem. So they asked Jesus and the other 10 are like, wait a minute, why didn't I think of that? So there's sort of that dynamic that's happening. And Jesus says, you know, This is how everybody else views leadership. They view it as um, trying to push each other out of the way and trying to get to it first and lording it over each other. Um, But that's not what I want for you. So this is what Jesus is trying to teach them. He's contrasting how others lead and how he expects the disciples to lead. So this is a teaching moment. He's trying to teach them something. So let's look at how Jesus described and demonstrated leadership. So he goes on and he says, Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here Jesus lays out his mission, and not just his mission, but his style of leadership, the way he's going to do it. And what he's teaching them is that greatness requires service. And leadership requires sacrifice. And this is so different from their understanding of how people lead. They're expecting people to lead with power and just to push other people out of the way. And he's saying, that's not what I want from you. Remember, Jesus is someone who everywhere that he's gone has noticed people on the outside, people on the margins, people that nobody else cares about. That's his mode of operation. And he's saying to the disciples, this is what I want for you. This is how you've seen me lead. This is how I want you to lead as well. So he came to serve and to give his life as a sacrifice. And this is the example of leadership that he gives us. So I want us to see Jesus's mission. Uh, what, What was Jesus attempting to accomplish? He was looking to restore our broken relationship with God and to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, to obey God by living a sinless life dying in our place and gaining victory over pain, death, and evil through his resurrection. 
These are the things that Jesus came to do. This is why he came to earth, why he lived the sort of life he did, and why he died on the cross. And I want us to see that when Jesus is demonstrating leadership, he's doing it by serving, by obeying God. So obedience is a key factor here. And by giving at a great cost to himself, he knew it was going to cost himself something. And he's saying, you know, to James and John in response to their crazy question, um, it's going to cost you something. Following Jesus is not an easy path. And he's direct and clear about that with them. And I want us to see that he showed us how to lead in the way he achieved his mission. So every step of this is um, an image that he's leaving us with about how it looks like to follow him. So what does it cost to follow Jesus? Because Jesus definitely said you need to be ready to pay a cost. You need to be aware that there is a cost to following Jesus. But I want us to see that what we give up is far less than what we gain. We've been talking a lot about how God, how God sent Jesus in order to restore us into relationship with him. And so Jesus is offering us himself. He's offering us a relationship with him, and it's a relationship that he came to restore. And then secondly, we need to give up our self-obsession. And this is something that I think we, it's so close to us that we don't see it. Um, Part of being human means we're obsessed with ourselves all the time. We're constantly focused on ourselves. And Jesus is calling us to see, notice, and observe other people around us and to see them as people that he loves and people that he came to sacrifice and to serve. Um, And it's only as we love him that we begin to be able to love others in the proper way. Instead of seeing them as extensions of ourselves or how they can benefit us, we start to see who God has designed them to be, and how we can also serve them. So instead, what we, the cost of following Jesus will teach us to learn to love God and love others. When we love God, when we have a relationship with him, we're able to um, be appropriate in the way that we treat others and to have a right view of ourselves in relation both to God and to others. And then finally, um, it's less of us and more of him. And this is a hard thing, I think, in a lot of ways, but um, it's teaching us to have a right view of ourselves and to know that um, God loves us best and knows us best. And it's only as we are in relationship with him that we have an idea of what our own purpose is. Um, And our purpose is to redirect uh, attention back on to God and to glorify him. So just to wrap up, Jesus gave his life so that we could be restored into a relationship with God. That was his mission, his purpose, and why he came. Jesus was a different kind of Messiah, and he had a different mission than people expected. Remember, you see the disciples really struggling with this because even they had this expectation like, well, sure, Jesus has been doing all this great stuff. He's been healing people. He's been flying under the radar. But now we're heading to Jerusalem, and this is the moment where he's going to come in and conquer everybody, and we get to be in charge. It's going to be great. So you see them kind of wrestling with that idea. But that's not what Jesus came to do. Um, What he did do was he came to serve and to give his life so that our lives could be restored. And that is his purpose and his mission is to restore us into relationship with God. And next week, we're going to look a little more in detail about how, the how and the why of how he did that. So I'm going to pray and then you all can head into your groups and talk about this a little bit more. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the example that you left us with of true leadership, that it involves sacrifice and service. And I thank you that you've given us an opportunity um, to put you first and to put ourselves, um, to see ourselves as less and to know that what we gain from our relationship with you is so much more than anything we leave behind. And I pray for these folks as they head into their groups that you would give them a sense of what your mission was and what kind of Messiah uh, you were and are and help us to understand what that means for us. In your name I pray, amen.